So let's start uh, session uh, four. Uh, the title of this session is uh, a special session on Korean capitalism. First uh, presenter uh, of this session is uh, uh, Thomas Korinsky, uh, Kory uh, Professor Graduate School of International Study, E for Women's University. Please. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference and give me the opportunity to present uh, some of my research and some of my ideas about um, continuity and change in Korean capitalism and particularly today on kind of the legacy of the developmental state in uh, how Korea conducts development cooperation. So not so much uh, uh, what developing countries can learn from the Korean developmental state, which is obviously a lot, um, but how Korean development cooperation is influenced um, by the institutions of the Korean developmental state. Um, this um, presentation is uh, based on a um, paper that you can also find in the uh, handout in the conference book that I am working on together with a PhD student of ours at Iwa Women's University, uh, Ms. Min Jong Park. And um, this is still work in progress very much and a very rough draft. And I really look forward to all your comments to improve this and make this a publishable uh, version. <clears throat> so what are some of the questions we have been asking in this uh, research? Um, what domestic factors influence Korean development cooperation, the way it is conducted. Particularly, of course, and that's the main question, how does the legacy of the Korean developmental state influences the way development cooperation and the relationship uh, is, con the development cooperation is conducted in Korea, and um, also in general, how the relationships with the developing um, countries are, are structured. Um, then we also ask the question, um, what are the outcomes of this kind of Korean style of development cooperation? And finally, um, what does this mean for the tensions that are existing between the way Korea conducts its um, development cooperation and the global norms that exist for development cooperation, particularly within the OECD um, DAC uh, the development, OECD Development Assistance Committee. So in the context of my previous uh, research, I think in this paper I tried to bring together a lot of things from my previous research and my previous interest and still ongoing interest in the transformation of the Korean developmental state in the context of the research also on Korean uh, on comparative uh, capitalism, Korea and Asian context of Asian debate on Asian capitalism, East Asian capitalism. Um, at the same time, I'm also very much interested and I've done research on development cooperation and also with case studies on development cooperation conducted by Korea. The question how new donors in East Asia um, are uh, kind of fitting into the international norms and maybe also potentially can contribute to the, to the global norms. Uh, finally, um, some of my recent research has been about what I've called the like, second image uh, international political economy. Uh, this is a term coming from a, a special issue um, that is actually, I received the email yesterday uh, uh, um, edited by um, Andreas Nölke, special issue in international politics. Uh, yesterday I received the email that the electronic versions are now out and uh, the paper version will be published in November. So if you want to have the PDF files, then uh, send me an email or you can we'll find them on the international politics uh, webpage. And now the question basically coming from like Kenneth Waltz, uh, uh, research on second image international relations. How do domestic institutions shape foreign economic policies and ultimately also international relations? Um, 
So the argument is that um, Korean Development Corporation, in this paper the argument is that Korean Development Corporation is shaped by, to a large degree shaped by the legacy of the developmental state in Korea. Mm -hmm. So the state uh, stimulates, leads and also facilitates Korean economic relations with the um, developing world. Um, development aid plays a very important role in facilitating Korean foreign investment and market access in the developing world. And in this case, we are looking at two African case studies. I will talk about them later. Um, finally, I also thought I, uh, uh, as a theoretical contribution, I introduced a new term, um, uh, institutional, which I call institutional retreat uh, to describe um, the way that the old institutions of the old developmental state are retreating into new policy fields while they become less relevant in their original fields let's say Korea, the development of Korean industries in Korea um, facilitating investment within Korea now these institu institutions are found a new role in um, helping Korean companies to expand globally, to invest, invest globally, and also to um, export globally, particularly when it comes to developing countries. So um, we all know the debate about like institutional um, spillover effect, institutional um, uh, layering, um, institutional conversion try to introduce this new term. Maybe it's similar to what has been previously been called institutional conversion, but I still try to make the point that it's still, there's some differences. You could call it also maybe institutional conversion light or something like that. Um, I, I look forward to the discussion with you, what you think about this, uh, this term. Um, so let me talk about the Korean developmental state and what it means for Korean developmental cooperation. So two main characteristics of the developmental state, uh, at least from my perspective, um, that are most relevant for us here um, are the state leadership and planning, um, the traditional kind of uh, developmental state argument by Chalmers Johnson and many, many others, uh, highlighting state autonomy. But then also, and we've heard a lot about this in this conference as well, the crucial point of the cooperation between the state and businesses and also the collusion uh, between the two um, embedded autonomy by Peter Evans and many, many more have been writing about that. I don't have to go into detail here. Um, now, if we look at Korea, we can find that this kind of developmental state has been maybe not dead, but at least substantially uh, weakened. Uh, businesses within Korea, the Jabol we've been hearing about a lot, they have been emancipating themselves from the state leadership, so they are not simply following the investment plans of um, uh, the government anymore and the goals of the government to create new employment, uh, particularly for the young generation, etc., etc. Um, and um, at the same time, through the process of democratization and the democratic civil society, there has also been, from this side, from the bottom up, there has been a challenge of this like strong kind of collusion between the state and the business. Of course, uh, and again, you can, we can discuss this later as well, I think it's very interesting that with the, um, the last two, uh, the current uh, conservative uh, government and the previous conservative administration under Im Yong Bak, um, we have kind of, we could see, we could say there has been this attempt to revitalize the old kind of Korean developmental state, um, um, force the Jebel to invest and employ new people. Um, but I think, I don't know what you think, to, to a large degree, I would say that this kind of attempt has failed. Um, 
However, when we look at the field of development cooperation, we could say that both of these elements of the developmental state have been still very much alive and well. Um, to kind of illustrate this, we look at two cases of Korean development cooperation and also generally economic cooperation with the developing world. Um, in Africa, and the first case is uh, Mozambique, um, also known, uh, there's a lot of Korean development cooperation and also it was one of the focus countries of Korea's so-called uh, resource diplomacy. And here, kind of the state leadership, state initiative um, becomes like very clear. Um, Mozambique became a strategic partner for Korean development cooperation in the year 2010 uh, and then in 2011 um, and there has been a lot of high-profile diplomatic exchange between these countries um, as well and uh, this kind of closer um, development cooperation, diplomatic cooperation uh, then facilitated and helped some large event, uh, investments by Korean companies in um, Mozambique and particularly um, by the Korean gas corporation, Kogas, which is a state-owned company which has been investing heavily in Mozambique in gas field and gas liquefaction projects starting in 2011. Um, so you can see very close cooperation and I'm bringing more examples of this close cooperation in, um, in the paper between the state and uh, here in this case a state-owned business. Uh, what is the outcome of this kind of development cooperation uh, from the Korean perspective? Um, the case of Mozambique has often been uh, dubbed a, um, a success story for resource diplomacy, actually a rare success story. There has been a lot of critique about the attempt of um, the Korean government to um, secure resources abroad, not just in the developing world, but uh, in many other countries um, as well. A lot of these projects have failed, or they were very extremely expensive. Um, but the Mozambique case um, was, uh, is often called a success story for Korea. So if we look at the, the gas that has been found in Mozambique, that could, um, that is equal to about five years of Korean demand for, uh, for natural gas. So it's a quite, for Korea you could say it was a success story when it comes to foreign investment. From the perspective of Mozambique, um, the story will, and of course we cannot say that for sure right now, we can only evaluate that when uh, looking back. Uh, in a couple of years, we, can, we are much, much smarter about this. Uh, but most likely, what we have known from research on this kind of investment in resource extractions, we all know the debate in, uh, about the resource curse and uh, collusion and corruption involving uh, governments and uh, companies in the resource industries, we expect that Probably this is from the perspective of Mozambique in generally for their development strategy, not a very um, successful story. Um, this looks a little bit different in, and uh, this is just a figure showing this, this uh, close correlation uh, between correlation between the um, uh, ODA, the development cooperation, and um, and the foreign investment starting in 2010 and then very rapid increase of development cooperation hand in hand with the investment by the state-owned company. So very briefly, the second case um, we are looking at at Rwanda um, and that's uh, the, the, the story there is much more uh, complex and the results are much more mixed and much better actually than in the case of uh, Mozambique, I would say. Um, there has been a long cooperation be between Korea and Rwanda already going back since uh, before 2000 and IT has been a big focus in this relationship for a long period of time. 
Um, and at the same time, also, the government in Rwanda has um, created its own national development strategy, building very much on improving IT infrastructure. And for this, it uh, uh, contracted a Korean company, Korea Telecom, to improve the infrastructure um, in uh, starting from 2007. So for Korea, this was the um, big success in penetrating the Korean IT, uh, the, the African IT market. Um, not just, of course, if we <coughs> think about the infrastructure, but then also potentially, probably we heard a lot about those who make the mobile phones, Samsung and LG this morning, uh, to then later also sell um, these smartphones in the newly created um, and improved IT infrastructure within Rwanda. Um, for Rwanda, um, we would say that uh, also we believe that there is a very good potential um, because there was a given national strategy in place um, for the development uh, of the IT sector and the IT infrastructure and then Korean investment was kind of inv in invited um, to build up this uh, infrastructure. So the investment and the development cooperation was embedded within this national strategy. There was a very strong ownership by the Rwandan um, government. And of course, we all know importance of IT infrastructure um, for development. And there has been a lot of um, quite interesting plans by the Rwandan government. Again, I, I want to refer to my paper um, because I just heard my time is running out. And uh, here you can see much uh, going the development cooperation going much uh, more back uh, in, in history and not just not this dramatic increase increase but a gradual increase of Korean bilateral aid to Rwanda so let me conclude um, we believe that and this is also the whole idea of the kind of what I coined the second image uh, IPE if we want to, I want to understand international relations and foreign policies of a country and the cooperation between countries and uh, international relations in, in general, we have to understand the domestic politi political economies of these, um, of these countries, in this case, Korea. Um, when it comes to the Korean developmental state, uh, we can see that uh, institutions are extending, or rather, as I use the term, retreating into new policy fields from the original ones where they have been uh, strongly challenged um, domestically by increasing civil society, for example. Um, and then you could ask, of course, and we didn't, don't go, we cannot, until now we haven't gone into uh, detail about this in the paper, but that's maybe one of the revisions that we want to do. The question is, of course, um, why can these are these institutions retreating uh, into this field? And that is, I would say, because Korean companies, they are latecomers in many developing countries, particularly when we're in Africa. Of course, if we look at Southeast Asia, the, the story is a little bit different, but in Africa, they are relatively newcomers. So they need support of their government. In this field, they, they still need the support of their government. They don't need it to invest in Korea, but they needed to invest in uh, Africa. Um, and then also, when we look at civil society, probably it's because foreign policies and particularly um, development cooperation are usually less scrutinized by critical civil society than, let's say, issues of employment or investment within Korea. Um, finally, um, new donors, the clash with global norms, including uh, new donors like Korea, but also if we think of even more, uh, much bigger players, of course, like China, maybe there is something we can learn from the Korean case. What happens if a new, there's a new kid on the block, a new, uh, a new donor, then challenging, or not openly challenging so far, the OECD duck um, um, rules. Um, 
And um, we have to, I think, carefully look at um, what this means. If we look at the Korean style development cooperation, it was a mixed picture. So in some sense, in some cases, it's maybe not uh, very beneficial, particularly for the developing country. Um, but on the other hand, when we look at the case of Rwanda, um, it can actually work. Uh, this is not, I wouldn't say this is an excuse for um, violating global norms like within the OEC DAC that demand completely untying of aid, not using aid for their international investments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think uh, particularly, of course, if like Korea or Japan, you have subscribed to these kind of global norms. But I think, of course, it could help to start a discussion about these global norms and maybe not all these global norms that have been shaped by the traditional Western donors are still, um, maybe we have to change some of them. Maybe some things are more important, like ownership, governance, while others, let's say, like untying aid or favoring grant uh, over loans might be not as important as, um, as the OECD duck thinks. Thank you very much. <laughs>